Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us once again. Uh, it's been very exciting for me personally uh, to study the book of Daniel and uh, uh, no, study my friends recently that I have been wanting to study the book of Daniel for myself for some time and, uh, and now for me to share what uh, I'm able to study. Uh, it is exciting and I pray that it is a blessing to you. And before we go any further, let's pray and ask God's blessings upon uh, our continuation of Daniel chapter 8. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given us to study your word. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for your Holy Spirit. You've promised to give us the Holy Spirit. And I claim that promise and I ask you that you may please help us to understand what we're going to study and what that means to us living here in the 21st century and in the everyday walk of our lives. And I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, as we're going to continue studying uh, Daniel chapter 8, I thought it will be good for us to review uh, what we saw yesterday uh, so it will make much more sense as we continue Daniel chapter 8. Now, yesterday we started off with understanding or reminding ourselves about the principle of repeat and enlarge in Bible prophecy, where the prophet, he repeats the same line of prophecy in another chapter, but with enlarged information, okay? The prophet, he repeats the same line of prophecy, but with enlarged information. That is what we saw yesterday in principle. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, uh, legs of fire and feet of iron and clay, and then a cut, a stone cut without human hands. Uh, all of these are a representation of the rise and fall of kingdoms. We saw that Babylon was symbolized by the head of gold. The chest and arms of silver is a symbol of Medo-Persia. The belly and thighs of bronze is a symbol of Greece. The legs of iron is a symbol of Rome. The feet of iron and clay is a symbol of divided Europe or, or a divided Rome. And then we see a stone which struck at the bottom of the image and became uh, a mountain and complete the entire earth is a representation of God establishing his everlasting kingdom. We see the same line of prophecy, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, repeated in chapter 7, but with an enlarged information using different symbols. In Daniel 7, um, we see that God uses wild animals to represent these different kingdoms, these uh, successive kingdoms uh, in Daniel chapter 7. We saw uh, you know, my friend Samuel, he shared how the lion, it represented Babylon and a bear with three ribs in his mouth and raised on one side, it represents the Medo-Persian empire. Uh, you know, we saw how the leopard with four heads and four wings, talking about its swiftness, it represents Greece. And then we saw that unlike the previous three animals, this was a more uh, a dreadful animal, a dreadful beast or a dreadful animal. And this represented the um, pagan Roman Empire. And on top of the head of this uh, dreadful beast, there were 10 horns. And then a little horn came up, uh, making way for three horns to fall down. And that little horn represented papal Rome. And then the next thing that we see in Daniel chapter 7 is the scene of the judgment. Okay, the scene of the judgment. And so what we see is the line of prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 and the line of prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 follows the same sequence. It correlates. It runs parallel, except that in Daniel chapter 7, there is enlarged information that is given. In Daniel chapter 7, an enlarged information is given. And so anytime... Once again, another major line of prophecy is mentioned, as we, as we saw yesterday in Daniel chapter 8. It has to follow the same sequence, but it ought to give us an enlarged information. Following the biblical interpretation or the rule of biblical interpretation, uh, which is the principle of repeat and enlarge. 
I also uh, reminded you of how the Bible interprets itself. You know, we don't, uh, Bible interprets, it interprets itself and then we go to the history to find its fulfillment. And that is how we study um, Bible prophecy. And so we came to Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 8, we see the same line of prophecy of chapter 2 and chapter 7 is followed, except that Babylon is not mentioned. There's a reason why Babylon is not mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. We will look at that in a moment. But we see that the Medo-Persian Empire is represented by a domestic animal, a ram with two horns, with one horn uh, higher than the other horn. Uh, talking about the Persian Empire, which will be much more dominant towards the end uh, than the Median Empire. And then we saw that there was a he-goat which came up this scene. And this he-goat had a notable horn and the notable horn was broken and it gave rise to four horns. And that represented the two faces of the, uh, the empire of Greece. We see the same order being repeated, Medo Persia and then Greece is repeated. I also made mention for you to observe that in Daniel chapter 7, wild animals are used, but in Daniel chapter 8, domestic animals are used. Specifically, these two animals, the ram and the goat, they are used in the sanctuary service, specifically on the Day of Atonement, and that's very, very interesting. And we're going to study about the Day of Atonement, um, I guess, briefly uh, in a moment. So we see uh, the ram, the goat, and then it there's another power that comes up the scene and that is the little horn. And that is a little horn. And uh, I'm not gonna review the little horn. I'm gonna go more a little more uh, detail into the little horn today as the way of continuing what we uh, studied yesterday or where we left off yesterday. And so if you have your Bibles, turn your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter eight, verses nine through 12. Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 through 12, as we continue uh, studying the book of Daniel, as we continue studying Daniel chapter 8. He tells, you know, this, Daniel sees this vision, and in this vision, the little horn comes after the, um, the kingdom of Greece, uh, after the kingdom of Greece. And the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 through 12, the following. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. In verse 10, and it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Verse 11, he even exalted himself as, the, as high as the prince of the host, and by him, that is by the little horn, the daily sacrifices were uh, taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth to the ground. He did all this and prospered. That is what we read about the little horn. And, uh, you know, two reasons why we believe that the little horn of Daniel chapter 8 is the Roman Empire. Reason number one, you know, as I told you earlier, according to the principle of repeat and enlarge, after Greece, Rome was the kingdom that was to arise. We see that in Daniel chapter 2. We see that in Daniel chapter 7. After Greece, uh, after the kingdom of Greece, it is the kingdom of Rome that was to come to power, which means the same order has to be followed in Daniel chapter 8. Medo-Persia, Greece, and then the Roman Empire has to come into the picture. And so that is one reason why we believe the little horn is the, it's talking about the Roman Empire. Another reason we believe the little horn is talking about the Roman Empire is because of uh, similar characteristics of the little horn in chapter 7, which we identified as the papacy uh, along with the uh, characteristics of the little horn in Daniel chapter 8. And I will repeat what I mentioned yesterday. The parallels between the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 
and the little horn of Daniel chapter 8? Well, the very first reason is uh, both of them are referred to as the little horn. You know, Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, uh, it refers to the Roman power to ask the little horn. Both of them, after small beginnings, uh, both the little horns, after small beginnings, later became exceedingly great. It became exceedingly great. Now, remember, I mentioned how the Medo-Persian Empire was referred to as great. The kingdom of Greece was referred to as very great. And the little horn of chapter 8 was referred to as exceedingly great. Okay, we see that progression there. The third shared characteristic or common characteristic between the little horn of chapter seven and uh, chapter eight is both of them made war against the saints and it destroyed the holy people of God. And then both of the little horns are described as boastful and arrogant. And then the little horn of chapter seven had eyes like the eyes of a man talking about the wisdom of the man instead of the wisdom of God. And then the little horn of chapter eight, through his cunning uh, devices, causes deceit to prosper. Once again, referring to the wisdom of uh, man instead of the wisdom of God. Both constitute the last kingdom on earth before Jesus comes again. In chapter seven, we see how after the little horn, it is the judgment scene, the judgment scene in heaven that we see. In chapter 8, we see the same sequence. After the little horn, it talks about the judgment scene in heaven. And we will come to that a little later on about the judgment scene. The activities of both the little horn in chapter 7 and chapter 8, it extends until the time of the end. And we will even look at that um, today. And then both come to their end when God destroys them. And so because of these shared common characteristics between the little horn of chapter 7 and the little horn of chapter 8, we come to the conclusion that the little horn of chapter 8 also talks about the Roman Empire. The only difference, though, in chapter between chapter 7 and chapter 8 of the little horn is that in chapter 7, the Roman Empire, the two faces of the Roman Empire is symbolized by two different, uh, well, in a way, two different um, uh, things, but they are related. You know, the dreadful beast was the symbolic representation of pagan Rome, and the little horn was the symbolic representation of papal Rome in chapter 7. But when you come to chapter 8, there is no dreadful beast. There is only one little horn, and that little horn uh, represents both the faces of the Roman Empire, both the stages of the Roman Empire, both the pagan stage of the Roman Empire and the papal stage of the Roman Empire. How do we know that? Let's see. If you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8 and uh, verse 9, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9, we see described the, um, the political phase or the uh, pagan room that is being referred to. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9 tells the following. It tells, And out of them which came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the pleasant land. We see that the little horn, the first stage of the little horn, there is a horizontal battle that is taking place. You know, there is a horizontal battle that's taking place towards the surrounding nations. It is more of a military and a political battle in nature. And, you know, uh, pagan Rome or imperial Rome, it conquered kingdoms in the south, uh, some of the kingdoms in the south, in the east, and the, and the glorious land. You know, in the south, it conquered Egypt. Towards the east, it conquered Greece. You know, it came up to power by conquering Greece. And then Asia Minor and Syria towards the east. And then the glorious land referring to um, the nation of Israel. And so we find how the Roman Empire uh, here 
pagan Roman Empire is referred to in verse 9. But there is a transition that takes place in verse 10. A transition that takes place in verse 10 from representing pagan Roman Empire to the papal Roman Empire. If you read verse 10, the Bible tells, And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, okay? And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary, that is the prince's sanctuary, was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. What we see here is a transition of the little horn from being a representation of the pagan Roman Empire to the papal Roman Empire. We see it is a vertical battle that's taking place. It is more religious in nature than being political in nature. Okay. And previously, the target of the little horn in verse 9, the target of the little horn when it represented the pagan Roman Empire was the south and the east and the glorious land. But the target of the second phase of the Roman Empire or the papal Rome are three things. The host of heaven, we will see who the host of heaven is a representation uh, of. And then the prince of the host, whoever the commander in chief of the host is. And then the, their, its target was the sanctuary and its troops. Its target was the sanctuary and its truths. So we see how there is a transition that takes place from pagan Roman Empire to the papal Roman Empire with just the uh, little horn being a representation of both. Now, as I told you, the target of uh, the little horn in its second stage or papal Rome were three things. It cast down the host of heaven so the stars of heaven. And second, it, second target was the prince of the host, the leader of the host. And the third target was it cast down, excuse me, it cast down the sanctuary and its truths. So let's understand what or who these three targets uh, were and it will make more sense to us as we study. Number one. The host and the stars of heaven, it cast, the Bible tells us that this little horn, which represented the second stage at this point, which is a representation of the papal Roman Empire, it cast down the host and the stars of heaven. What is that referring to? You know, I told you yesterday that we let the Bible interpret itself. So... Uh, I also mentioned to you yesterday, which I uh, forgot to mention earlier, Daniel chapter 8 can be divided into two parts. Verses 1 through 14, we see that Daniel is given a vision. And verses 15 through 27, or 26 in particular, um, is the interpretation of the vision that was given earlier. And so for us to understand who the host of heaven that the papacy was targeting, we go to the Bible itself to understand who the host of heaven is. Verse 24, it tells, uh, and his power shall be mighty, talking about the little horn, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. So the host of heaven here in Daniel chapter 8 is referring to God's people. Uh, who were persecuted by the, uh, by the Roman Empire, who were persecuted by the Roman Empire. Um, we know that uh, the Jews and the Christians during the first century and uh, during the Dark Ages were persecuted by both the pagan and the papal Roman Empire. In fact, uh, oh yeah, we'll come to that later on. You know, uh, emperors, Roman emperors such as Nero 
and uh, Diocletian and all these people, they persecuted God's people, those who were Christians, those who followed Christ, those who opposed following the pagan uh, practices of that uh, day and age. They were persecuted by these pagan Roman empire or emperors. But we also notice that God's people during the dark ages were persecuted by the papal Roman Empire. You know, just to give you an example, the Crusades, I'm quoting to you from a book called uh, Daniel, a Reader's Guide by Dr. William Shea, and he writes, the Crusades of the 11th through the 13th centuries against infidels in the Middle East were holy wars directed by the papacy. From these, the idea of crusades against Christian heretics, Christian heretics was developed, leading to the attacks on the um, Albigenses in southern France and the Walden seats in northern Italy in the, in the 13th century. You know, you go read history and, you know, uh, the Bible talks about 1,260 years of Bible prophecy in Bible prophecy, which refers to for how many years God's people were persecuted and they were tormented. You know, recently we celebrated, or in the United States, uh, we celebrated the uh, Thanksgiving. You know, what were they thanking? I mean, what was the historical uh, route to Thanksgiving? You know, they were a group of pilgrims who came from Europe seeking for religious freedom. Why? Because there was religious persecution that was taking place during that time. And uh, we see how um, this little horn, it persecuted God's people, uh, God's holy people are the saints and uh, the host of heaven was cast down. So that is the first target. What is the what was the second target of this little horn? We read in verse 11, yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. So who is the prince of the host? Who is this referring to? In Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, my friend Samuel will um study that with you next Monday. But we see that Jesus is referred to as the prince, the Messiah, the prince. We find in Daniel chapter 10, verses 13 and 21, and also in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, that Jesus is referred to as Michael, the prince. Okay, in Daniel chapter 9, Jesus is referred to as Messiah, the prince. And in Daniel chapter 10 and in 12, Jesus is referred to as Michael, the prince. And so when the Bible tells us that this little horn magnified himself, even to the prince of the host, it is talking about the Roman Empire targeting Jesus Christ himself, targeting Jesus Christ himself. You know, uh, pagan Rome uh, crucified Jesus. Jesus was crucified during the time of um, the pagan Roman Empire in AD 31. And you know, I need to mention as I go, before I go further, I need to mention this. I'm mentioning to you or referring to the um, pagan Roman Empire and papal Roman Empire. And of course, uh, you know who, uh, which entity the papal Roman Empire is referring to. And let me be very, very frank with you. God loves every single people on this earth. He loves every single person on this earth. And the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say that God only loves certain groups of people. He loved the entire world that he gave his only begotten son to everyone that whosoever believes in him should not perish. God loves everyone. God gave Jesus Christ to everyone. But Bible prophecy is mentioning both pagan and papal Roman Empire to cause all this disturbance. That doesn't mean God doesn't love them. God is simply outlining in the prophecies of Daniel, and we will see in Revelation, he is simply outlining what will take place, uh, what has taken place and what will take place because of, I mean, with 
uh, papal Rome. That doesn't mean God doesn't love them. And I have dear close family members who are part of the system of the Roman Catholic Church. And so I know that God loves them. Very, very kind people, very devout people. And, but the truth needs to be told. You see, the truth needs to be told. And you know, the little horn, it's referring to the system, the papal system. It is not referring to just one single person. And that needs to be very, very clear in our minds. And so when I'm talking to you about you know, the little horn attacking and persecuting God's people during the dark ages, I mean, it's history, it's Bible prophecy um, that has been fulfilled through history. And we see that uh, the papacy uh, eventually attacking uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ or the truths of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's history. It's talking about the entire system. So I want you to keep in, I want you to please remember that it's talking about the entire system. God loves individuals. God has died for everyone, but truth needs to be told. But anyway, the first target was the host of heaven. It targeted Christians in the first century and during the Middle Ages, there was persecution by the papacy uh, when people did not obey, um, when, uh, you know, when people did not obey their commands. And then it was the prince of the host, which is referring to Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus was put to death on the cross by imperial Rome or by pagan Rome in AD 31. But also the papacy, it attacked the truths of Jesus Christ. Um, during the uh, Middle Ages. So we see how the little horn, it targets God's people, but also the commander in chief, uh, that is Jesus Christ. And then what was the third target? Towards the end of verse 11, it tells, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, verse 12. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. It cast down truth to the ground, it practiced and prospered. Yes, pagan Rome destroyed the temple of the Jews in AD 70, but papal Rome destroyed the truths that the sanctuary taught through symbolism, that sanctuary taught through symbolism. And I want you to observe another interesting uh, thing here in Daniel chapter eight. We see the ram and we see the goat, which was used in the sanctuary. And then we see in verses uh, 11 and 12 that the little horn is attacking uh, God's sanctuary, which represented God's truth in symbolism. And then we will see a little later on that this chapter is talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary. So what we are getting to here is that the theme of Daniel chapter 8 is the sanctuary. The sanctuary, specifically the cleansing of the sanctuary and how God restores his truth and how God um, you know, brings out a group of people who believe in the truths of the sanctuary um, that it uh, symbolized. But how did papal Rome cast down the truths of the sanctuary? This is how, you know, one author writes, uh, but before we see how the truth was cast down of the sanctuary, we need to understand what truths the sanctuary taught, you know? And so uh, for a moment, let's turn our attention to the sanctuary. The first time the sanctuary is, uh, the word sanctuary is mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Exodus chapter 25 and verse eight. The Bible tells, this is God talking to Moses and he tells, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. What was the sanctuary you may ask? The sanctuary was a visual aid to teach people about the plan of salvation. Just simply put, okay? The sanctuary was a visual aid to teach people about the plan of salvation. You and I are in the middle of a pandemic. There is death, disease, and decay, and suffering that is happening in this world. What is the root cause of all this? 
the root cause of all this is sin. It is sin that is causing people heartbreak. It is sin that is causing depression in this world. It is sin that is causing pain in this world. It is sin that is causing divorce in this world. It is sin that is the root cause of everything bad and everything evil in this world. And God gave us the sanctuary as a visual aid for us to understand how God wants to remove sin from this world, how God wants to put sin to an end so he can put sin, suffering, death, and disease that you and I are faced with to an end. And that is why the sanctuary is so important. It was a visual aid of God teaching us of how he is going to put sin to an end and how he is going to save us. The sanctuary was divided or it had three parts uh, to the sanctuary. You know, sometimes, yes, it's two parts, but just to be more specific, I'm mentioning to you that there are three parts to the sanctuary. First is the courtyard. And the second part to it is the holy place. And the third part to it is the most holy place. These are the three uh, parts to the sanctuary. The courtyard, it teaches how God removes the penalty of sin. The holy place, it teaches how God removes the power of sin from our lives. And the most holy place, we understand how God removes the presence of sin eventually. Okay, I'm going to repeat that to you again. The sanctuary is God's visual aid on how he's going to eradicate sin from this world and from our lives, and how he's going to redeem us. It is a visual aid. The courtyard, it had two articles. It had the altar of sacrifice, and then it had the laver. Some of you must have studied about that in the earlier presentations. The altar of sacrifice is where a lamb or an animal was sacrificed instead of the sinner who was supposed to face that death. And then we see the laver where the priest washed themselves. And my friends, the courtyard, it taught us the truth or it teaches us the truth of how God removes the penalty of sin. Christ is represented as the lamb in the courtyard. We move to the holy place. There we see three articles. We see the table of shoebread. We see the altar of incense and we see the seven branch uh, candlesticks. There we understand how God removes the present, the power of sin from our lives. But we also understand that Christ is our priest there in the holy place. We come to the most holy place. We see how Christ is not only the lamb in the courtyard. Christ is not only the priest in the holy place, but he's the high priest and the judge in the most holy place. And there in the holy place, we see how God goes about the process of removing sin's presence from this earth. So there can be a clean camp. So there can be a clean universe from sin. Christ as the high priest and our judge. But also in the most holy place, we see the importance of the Ten Commandments. We see the importance of the law of God. What I described to you is the earthly tabernacle. And what I want you to understand is that the earthly sanctuary and its services was just a shadow of the reality which was in heaven. The earthly sanctuary was just a type of the reality. You know, if you go to my house in India, I mean, growing up, there was one of our family members had got this bucket of Legos and I just enjoyed Legos. And, you know, I made this tiny uh, grand piano and these different things from these Legos. And, you know, my grandparents, they were proud of their grandson. So they have it there in the showcase of our house. And right next to it, there is a small miniature Taj Mahal. But that was not the real Taj Mahal, you see. It is just a miniature Taj Mahal. But the real Taj Mahal is in Delhi. 
in a similar fashion, the earthly sanctuary is just a miniature, is just a representation of the real sanctuary in heaven. How do we know that? Two verses. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. Talking about um, the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, it tells, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Okay, the earthly tabernacle or the sanctuary is just a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle for See, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 9, it tells, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So what we see here is that an earthly sanctuary was a representation of the heavenly sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary is the real one. In fact, if you go to the book of Revelation, we see Jesus walking among the candlesticks. We see um, um, how the veil in temple is open. We see the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. And we see that in Revelation chapter 11. And so we see that there is a sanctuary in heaven and the earthly sanctuary was just a representation of it. Why am I mentioning all this? We see that this little horn, it attacked or it cast down the sanctuary and its truths. The sanctuary, it teaches us the truth that Christ is the lamb. That we don't have to earn our salvation. Rather, Jesus has died for us. We simply need to believe in Jesus, the Lamb of God, for us to be saved. The earthly sanctuary teaches us the reality of the heavenly sanctuary, that Jesus Christ is our priest, that we don't need to go to any priests on this earth to be our mediator. Jesus alone is our true mediator. We come to the most holy place. We see Jesus is the high priest. He is the judge who will judge us according to the Ten Commandments. But we see that papal Rome, it casts down the Ten Commandments, specifically the command, the Sabbath commandment. Here are a few quotes that I will read to you. Um, here is a quote. It tells, they were taught not only to look to the Pope as their mediator, but to trust to the works of their own to atone for sin. I mean, Jesus Christ, who was represented by a lamb throughout the um, services of the earthly sanctuary, he died for us. We don't need to atone for our sins, but you know, they were taught to look to their own to atone for their sins. Long pilgrimages, acts of penance, the worship of relics, the erection of churches, shrines and altars, the payment of large sums to the church. These and many similar acts were enjoined to appease the wrath of God or to secure his favor. As if God were like men to be angered at trifles or pacified by gifts or acts of penance. Papacy taught people that you got to earn your salvation. I mean, that is why Martin Luther was climbing up the stairs to earn his salvation. But the truth of the Bible is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, died for you and me. It is by trusting in Jesus. It is by having faith in Jesus that whatever sin you may have committed, you can be forgiven of. You don't need to earn your salvation. You don't need to earn your salvation. But papacy, it casts down that truth. There's another person who tells, but how, for instance, could the papacy cast down the place or foundation of the heavenly sanctuary? The papacy didn't get into heaven and physically attack the sanctuary. Instead, through its system of the mass, the priesthood, confession, mediation, etc., which is a counterfeit of the life, death, and high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, the prince of the host, the foundation of Christ's work in heaven was lost or in a sense 
cast down. So I hope it's clear to you how the papacy, it attacks God's people. Second, it attacks Jesus Christ. Third, it attacks the sanctuary and its truths. It attacks sanctuary and its truths. It's another quote I will read and then we can move on. It tells, the ascension of the Roman church to, the power, to power marked the beginning of dark ages. As her power increased, the darkness deepened. Faith was transferred from Christ, the true foundation to the Pope of Rome. Instead of trusting in the Son of God for forgiveness of sins and for eternal salvation, the people looked to the Pope and to the priests and prelates to whom he delegated authority. They were taught that the Pope was their earthly mediator and none could approach God except through him and further that he stood in the place of God to them and was therefore to be implicitly obeyed. The little horn. It cast the truths of the sanctuary to the ground. My friends, why is this so important? And as I told you earlier, God loves every individual on this earth, but God's word is against this system. The system is not a biblical one. And why is the Bible warning us against this? Why is the Bible outlining to us about this? One author writes, why was this conflict so important? Because it dealt with the source of the plan of salvation. It was a struggle between two different plans of salvation. The original heavenly one and a later earthly substitute. What could be more important? What could be more important? You see, my friends, we are on this earth struggling with sin and sickness and hatred and injustice in this world. And we know it is the result of sin. And God, through the truths of the sanctuary, he's teaching us how he wants to save us. He's teaching us how much he loves us. He's teaching us how he wants to redeem us. And when there's an attack to these very truths, God is telling, I want to save you. I want to put end to divorce. I want to put suffering to an end. I want to put death to an end. I want to put coronavirus to an end. I want to put all these things to an end. But in order for you to do that, I need to put sin to an end. It is the sanctuary, the truths of the sanctuary, which teaches us how God puts sin to an end. And the battle is against these very truths. And that is why the Bible is talking to us about it. You may think that the little horn is done with its work in history. But if you go to the book of Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, we see something very interesting. There are two beasts mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. You know, we understand from our earlier studies that beast represents the kingdom or power. And the first beast, we don't have time to study who the second beast is, but the first beast of Revelation 13, the characteristics of the first beast of Revelation 13 is very much similar to the characteristics of the little horn in chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Daniel. And thereby we come to the conclusion that the first beast of Revelation 13 refers to the papacy. It refers to the papacy. What are the parallels between the little horn of chapter 7 and 8 of Daniel and the first beast of Revelation 13? Um, here are the parallels. The first beast of Revelation 13 and the little horn power of 7 and 8 are the same. Why? Because Revelation 13 refers to the same entities of Daniel chapter 2, 7 and 8. To be specific, the mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear, the leopard and the dragon gave him power, throne and great authority. Do you see those three animals mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, chapter 2 and chapter 7? Certainly. And these are the same animals uh, that is referred to in uh, 13, in chapter 13 of Revelation. 
The first beast of Revelation 13 blasphemed just as the little horn of Daniel 7 and 8. We, we understood what that blasphemy was. The first beast of Revelation 13, it persecuted God's saints just as the little horn of chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8. The first beast of Revelation 13 persecuted God's people for the same amount of time as the little horn in chapter 7 of Daniel. So do you see similarities? We certainly do. And so we come to the conclusion that the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 is the papacy. But what I want to focus on a little bit more deeper in Revelation chapter 13 is as follows. Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 17. Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 17 tells the following. Now, Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 17, it's now talking about the second beast. Okay, the second beast. We don't have time to go and identify who the second beast is in this study. But uh, just for now, we'll look at the characteristics. It tells, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast referring to the first beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 13, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. What we gather from the second beast of Revelation 13 is this. Whichever power or entity the second beast represents in the future, I mean, talking about our time in the future, this second beast, this second kingdom is going to resurrect, will, will assist in resurrecting the first beast of revelation to do the work that it did during the dark ages. Church and state united during the middle ages. Revelation talks about the union of church and state, religion and politics. And the central issue there, my friend, is worship. That is why Daniel chapter 1 through 6 is so important. In chapter 3, we see how it was an issue of worship. In chapter 6, we see once again how it was an issue of worship that Daniel and his friends were faced with. But they were faithful to God. And they were faced with a death decree. In the end time, the issue will be worship. And we will be faced with a death decree. My friends, but the Bible tells us in the very next chapter of Revelation, chapter 14, and verse 7, the first angel tells, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. That's very interesting. You'll come to that in a moment. And worship him, that is worship God, that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. At a time when, when the first beat of revelation, the papacy will be revived once again, and the issue will be worship, and we will be faced with a death decree. God is calling us to worship him alone. God is calling us to worship the creator alone. Whose side are you on this evening? Are you worshiping the true creator? And then we see verses 9 through 12. Maybe let's just read um, verse 12. It tells, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. At the moment, when papacy enforces the law of worship through political system, the Bible tells us uh, there will be a group of people like Daniel. There will be a group of people like Daniel and his friends in the end time who will say we will worship God and nobody. We will worship God and nothing else. And my friends, where is our allegiance? Is our allegiance in Christ or to something else? There's a verse that, you know, my, my professor has often quoted and it has stuck with me for very long time. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5. It tells, 
if you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with the horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? In other words, Jeremiah is saying, if you are not able to keep up and are not faithful to God during peaceful times, how will we be faithful to God during the end times when things are tough? My friends, we saw in Daniel chapters 1 through 6, Daniel and his friends were faithful to God from the beginning. It was not at the moment of crisis that they were faithful to God. At the moment of crisis, character was revealed and character was developed over time. It is not until the end time when we are faced with the issue of worship and death decree that we can stand strong. We need to make that decision today. Who will we follow? Will we follow God and the truths of the sanctuary that it represented? That Christ alone is our lamb, substitute lamb. That Christ alone is our priest and Christ alone is our judge. And the importance of the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath. Are we going to take a side on that? Or will we take a different side? The message of Daniel 8, it reaches down to you and me. But we praise God. We praise God that Daniel chapter 8 doesn't end there. Daniel chapter 8 doesn't end with the little horn power, with the Roman papal power, targeting God's people, targeting God's truths, and targeting God himself. It doesn't end there. The Bible tells us in verse 13 and 14 of Daniel chapter 8, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice? Sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. How long will God's uh, truths be trampled to the ground? Verse 14 gives us the answer. It tells, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed or restored. For how long? Will this little horn power trample down God's truth of the sanctuary? How long will this little horn power misrepresent the truths that was taught in the sanctuary? That Christ was the lamb, that Christ is our priest, that Christ is our uh, high priest and our judge. For how long? The Bible tells. For 2,300 days and then shall the sanctuary will be cleansed. Let's look at the 2,300 days and then, then let's look at uh, the sanctuary being cleansed briefly. You know, I told you that there's a reason why uh, Babylon was not mentioned in the book of Daniel chapter 8. Here's the reason why. The starting point of the 2,300 days is from the time of the Medo-Persian Empire. You know, in Daniel chapter 9, when we come there, we will understand the specific dates, okay? But the starting point of the 2,300 days is from the time of the, uh, of the ram with two horns, the Medo-Persian Empire. And it reaches down to the time of the end. How do we know? Daniel chapter 8 and verse 26. I told you that the second portion of Daniel chapter 8 is the interpretation of the vision that was given earlier. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 26 tells us, and the vision of the evenings and the mornings, referring to the 2,300 days prophecy, which was told is true. And then it tells, therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. We see the same words found in Revelation, I mean, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. It tells, but you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. In chapter 8, we, we see it tells, seal the vision. We here see, seal the book until the time of the end. Why? Because many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. In the 2,300 days, it comes to an end, the time of the end, it begins, and the sanctuary begins to be cleansed. And also, 
We see in Daniel chapter 2, it was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and God establishing his kingdom. In Daniel chapter 7, we see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, represented by the dreadful beast, papal Rome, represented by the little horn, and the next thing that we see in Daniel chapter 7 is the scene of the heavenly judgment. We see the Ancient of Days come. We see the angels ministering there. We see the books are opened. We see the Son of Man come to the Ancient of Days. We see the judgment in heaven. Which means the same parallel should be found in Daniel chapter 8. If Miro Persia was mentioned by the ram, represented by the ram, if Greece was represented by the goat, if um, the pagan Rome and the papal Rome was represented by the little horn, then the next scene or the next, next sequence should be the judgment. And so we understand from this that when the Bible talks about judgment in heaven and the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven, it's talking about the same thing. I hope you're catching that point. Judgment in heaven and the cleansing of the sanctuary, it is the parallel and it is talking about the same thing. Now, very briefly, what is the cleansing of the sanctuary? Now, earlier I mentioned to you the outline of the sanctuary, the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. The courtyard teaches that Christ is our lamb. The holy place teaches that Christ is our high priest. And the most holy place teaches that Christ, I mean, the holy place teaches that Christ is our priest. And the most holy place, Christ is our high priest and our judge. That is what we see from the outline of the sanctuary. Now, what is the cleansing of the sanctuary? Very, very briefly, uh, this is what the cleansing of the sanctuary is. There are two types of services that took place in the earthly sanctuary. And keep in mind, what we understand of the earthly sanctuary is a representation of what happens in the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, So there are two types of services that took place in the earthly sanctuary. First was the daily service. You know, say that I steal something and I feel very guilty for what I did. I, I bring a lamb without blemish. I'm guilty. The lamb is innocent. But by faith, I confess my sins onto the lamb. And then now the lamb, the innocent lamb is bearing that guilt. Instead of my place, the lamb dies. And then, you know, the sinner, he slits the throat of the lamb. The blood is taken. And then the priest he takes the blood of the lamb that was sacrificed in a bowl and he takes it inside the holy place and he sprinkles that blood before the veil that divided the um, most holy place and the holy place. Because the law of God was there, you know, it was the law of God which condemned me as a sinner. And I go to Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. And in my place, Jesus dies. And then we see how just as the uh, blood was taken inside the holy place, that Jesus entered into the holy place with his own blood. And also that blood which was taken inside the holy place, uh, it represented the record of my sin. It represented the record of my sin. I think I'm kind of getting uh, mixed up or I, either I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, that is what happened every single day. Okay, the, the lamb, a lamb was sacrificed, the blood was taken inside the holy place, and the record of sin was inside the holy place. That happened every single day of the Hebrew calendar. But there was, except for one day, there was one day, that is the day of atonement, which is a yearly service when the record of sin I told you that the, the blood inside the sanctuary represents the record of our sin. Now, that had to be blotted out in a similar fashion. I think I'm getting it of myself. In a similar fashion, the record of our sins in the heavenly sanctuary has to be blotted out. And so, just as there was the yearly service of the Day of Atonement, 
there was a day of atonement or the cleansing of the sanctuary that was to take place in the antitypical day of atonement. Let me look at my notes so I don't confuse you. Uh, all right. All right. Let me try to finish this up real fast. Okay, now, on the day of atonement or during the antitypical or during the day of atonement or during the yearly service, this is what uh, happened. You know, usually every single day, the blood was taken inside as a record of our confessed sins. In the same way, the record of our confessed sins are in the record books of heaven. If you read Daniel at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, it talks about the book of life and these different record books in heaven. And when you study Daniel chapter 7 in verse 10, we see that the books were opened. The books were opened in the heavenly judgment. Those books contain the record of our confessed sins. Okay, when we confess our sins, when we ask God for our forgiveness, our confessed sins are recorded in the books of heaven. We are completely forgiven. We are no longer guilty. We are no longer under condemnation. But the record of our confessed sins are in heaven. Just as there ought to be a blotting out of sin in the earthly sanctuary. In the same way, in the heavenly sanctuary, the record of our sin needs to be cleansed or blotted out. You see that in Hebrews chapter 9, verses uh, 22 and 23. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. It tells, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Look at verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things better uh, themselves with better sacrifices than these. Why is this blotting out of sin so important? You know, when we confess our sins, God forgives us. But that doesn't mean we have overcome our sin. Okay, it doesn't mean that we have overcome our sin. The reason that God waits to blot out our sin is to see if we have overcome our sin. That is why it is very important for us that we not only confess our sins to God, but we also God to help us overcome our sins. We see in the book of Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Verse 11, to him who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Verse 17, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Verse 26 through 28, to him who overcomes and who keeps my deeds until the end, I will give authority over the nations. Chapter 3 and verse 5 of Revelation, to him who overcomes will be clothed in white garments. Verse 12 of chapter 3 of Revelation. To him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The reason that our sins are recorded in the books of the heavenly sanctuary is to see if we have overcome the sins that we confessed before. And so my friends, when the judgment is taking place in heaven, when the record books are opened, when my name comes up, all right, John, he has confessed that he lied on this day and this lie. But then the heavenly hosts are interested has John overcome this sin? Has John overcome this sin? If John has overcome this sin, then they blot out my sin from the record books of heaven. You know, in the earthly tabernacle, the priest, he cleanses the sanctuary from the record. Uh, the, the, he blots out the record of the sins of the children of Israel. When that was happening, the children of Israel were standing around the sanctuary. This is what they were doing. On that day, 
Levitic, the book of Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 29 tells us they were to afflict themselves and humble themselves on the day of atonement when the high priest is inside the most holy place cleansing the sanctuary from the record of sin. Second, they were not to work on the day of atonement or during the judgment day, if you please. Third, they were to be cleansed from sin on the day of judgment or the day of atonement. They were to be made making sure that my sin is, has been confessed, that I have overcome my sin. In a similar fashion, my friends, you and I, as we will see in chapter 9, according to this time prophecy, that you and I are living on the day of atonement. And you and I ought to be confessing our sins to God, but also overcoming our sins. We are to afflict our souls. What does that mean? We ought to humble our souls. Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, it tells, For the sorrow that is humbling, that is according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. One author writes the following. We are now living in the great day of atonement. In the typical service, while the high priest was making the atonement of, for Israel, all were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people. In like manner, all who have their names retained in the book of life, that is those uh, who want to be saved, who have confessed their sins, should now in the few remaining days of their probation afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be a deep, faithful searching of the heart. My friends, the little horn, it trampled down the truths of the sanctuary and it led the people during that time live a shallow Christian life. But when the time of the end started, at the end of 2,300 days, which began from the time of the Middle Persian Empire, you and I are living during judgment time. You and I are to have a deeper experience and not a shallow experience of eradicating sin from our lives. At the end of 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary will be cleansed. The little horn which caused for a shallow Christian experience, no longer has a power because God's people at the end of 2,300 days would have discovered this deep experience that they can have with God in eradicating sin from their lives. My question to you as I end, I, did, I mean, I was scratching the surface. I could not exhaust what we were studying, but what I want you to take away from this study is this. Number one, the little horn power will be revived in the end time. Church and state will unite. Worship will be the central issue. Death decree, we will face it. We ought to be faithful now to God. We ought to keep God's all of God's Ten Commandments now so we can be faithful when we are faced during a crisis with a death decree. The second thing that we take away from the study of Daniel chapter 8 is we are living during judgment time when the sanctuary is being cleansed. Will you and I overcome the sins that we have confessed? These are things let us consider to be considered and to be pondered upon. May God bless you as we continue studying the book of Daniel.